down to uh, to about a 25 mile apogee, uh, we'll see that uh, the the delta v or the remaining uh, velocity that we need to uh, slow down is almost uh, 471 feet per second. And for every two of those foot per second, we lower our orbit by a, a one mile. So essentially that deorbit burn simply will slow discovery down enough that it will force it to drop back out of orbit and begin it coming back down toward the Earth, correct? That's correct. And we just uh, follow a, a thermal uh, profile that uh, will ensure that we do re-enter the atmosphere and not exceed any uh, thermal constraints of the, of the vehicle. And we're now uh, 30... We are uh, continuing to watch uh, NASA's graphics as it uh, gets ready to order the command for that big deorbit burn in just about a minute from now. Uh, one of the concerns, it has been explained to me by, by astronaut Story Musgrave, and, and Winston, perhaps you can chime in on this. The crosswind concern, as you look at this shuttle model head-on, is that as the crosswinds build up, the shuttle naturally tends to land a little bit skewed like this as it's coming in. I should point it at more of an attitude of attack, but it's going to come in with the, the nose a little bit off center, and the braking then becomes an issue. That because as those rear wheels touch down, the pilot has to maneuver the brakes to, to bring this thing in straight. You're absolutely right. Uh, what you'd like to do, of course, is be able to bring the shuttle in so that the nose is exactly lined up with the runway. But with the crosswind, you can't do that. You essentially come in at a crab, at an angle. And that's uh, not only uncomfortable, but at extreme angles can be a little bit dangerous. And they want to, they, they of course, uh, have had some braking problems with the early versions of the shuttle, and they, they want to they want to try and save those brakes as much as they can. Exactly. It's not so much the braking, but uh, directional stability, being able to steer the run, the uh, orbiter down the runway. You don't want to depart the side of a runway. That's, that's the concern. Right. Alicia Cunha, once again, is in Houston at Mission, Con Mission Control, where they're getting ready to order that deorbit burn. Alicia? Alicia has no answer. We have lost our communications with uh, Alicia. You're familiar with that phenomenon, Jim Lovell, yeah, quite, from your many trips around the moon. <laughs> quite a bit. Listen, let me ask you a question. Uh, you talked about, you know, a lot of the reentry is computer control, but when does the flight commander take over? Actually, the pilot takes over just under Mach 1, around Mach 0.9. Just under the speed of sound, they'll take over and they'll fly it manually. Let's listen to uh, NASA. The deorbit burn has begun. Landing is now targeted for runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center at 11.04 a.m. Central Time. Alicia Acuna is there at the uh, Mission Control, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Alicia, it's a, a momentous time. Uh, is there any reaction from the folks behind you? Well, let me see. It's kind of hard to tell. From here, it looks like there's just it's intense concentration. And I'm not sure if you can see too far above my shoulder. There are two women who will be bringing Discovery in. The woman in the light green shirt with the long blonde hair, that is Linda Hamm. She is the re-entry flight director. This is her job to bring this shuttle in. Now, the voice of home for Discovery is the woman sitting just to her right. That's Susan Still. Now, she is the cap communicator. Which stands for capsule communication. Actually, capsule is from the Mercury days. It doesn't really apply anymore, but it's called. She's called the Capcom. She will talk to Discovery as they come down. So right now, everyone is just really concentrating. I'm sure for the next hour or so, they're waiting where they can give that sigh of relief. Yeah, for all of the uh, import that comes with that moment, there's not a great deal of reaction there. It, it seems everybody is very business-like, Alicia, behind you. Exactly. Everyone right now is just concentrating on doing their jobs. This is a very important time, this next hour or so. Right now, the deorbit burn is in process, and they will enter the Earth's atmosphere. This is a crucial time for discovery, especially with the winds picking up quite a bit. They have only one chance to land. They cannot circle around like a jetliner would be able to if there were problems. They have one shot, one chance to land. Right now, there's no turning back. So yes, everyone is concentrating on bringing Discovery home safely. Alicia Acuna there at Mission Control, thank you. Winston Scott, it's been explained to me that there is what is called uh, an ascending or a descending reentry. A descending essentially means that the shuttle is coming in sort of north to south over North America. Ascending means it's coming in south to north over Mexico. That is correct. And uh, to be honest with you, John, I'm not sure which one they're going to do. I think uh, this discovery is going to be on a descending 
node, but their trajectory is going to take them right over Houston, over Louisiana, and they'll swing out over the Gulf and then make their hanging alignment circle right here over the top of the Cape. And the speeds on re-entry are phenomenal. The speeds are phenomenal. We'll hit uh, entry interface, or just before entry interface, like about Mach 25. That's 25 times the speed of sound, and we'll wind up at a nice, smooth touchdown and roll out to zero from someplace in orbit. It's, it's incredible. And we're going to hear that uh, sonic boom as they go supersonic still pretty close to the Cape here. We'll hear the sonic boom, and there'll be two of them, by the way, as they drop below supersonic speeds over the Cape. Well, there is no turning back now. Uh, the shuttle is on its way down. The deorbit burn to slow that bird down and bring it back to Earth with John Glenn and the six other astronauts on board has been executed. Uh, the we are going to be back with more coverage right after we take a news break. Ryan and Walter Cronkite for the conclusion of this historic mission. Live today, noon Eastern, on CNN. What we can expect. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Saw so that. Well, you're absolutely right, and now they're committed. They have fired the engines to get them down into a lower orbit. Uh, I'll show you on this model. It's uh, these two engines right here. Uh, they were up in their full orbit, over 300 miles uh, up and they fired those engines to drop down into a lower orbit. Once that's done, the shuttle can't get back up. That means it automatically, from now on, loses altitude to bring it into a, essentially a gliding landing uh, here at the Kennedy Space Center at four minutes after noon Eastern time. Now, I'll tell you what's happened then. The runway is running like that right behind me out there. And this, this, the, the shuttle will come over it at about 50,000 feet, make a big loop out in this direction, dropping fast now, about six or seven times faster than a commercial airliner when it descends. And then it lines up for its final approach into, uh, again, this is a glide now. Uh, he can't go around or anything like that. He's got to line up on that runway exactly. And, uh, and then when he hits the runway, he'll be uh, traveling at 235 miles an hour. So that is still somewhat hotter than a commercial aircraft and dropping in a lot faster. Meantime, there was quite a discussion about the weather before they decided to go for this first opportunity. Uh, there were some crosswinds up there, but the key factor, the chief of astronauts, Charlie Precor, is up there uh, flying, and he had tested it three or four times and uh, radioed back that he thought it was fine that they would do it because those winds were sort of on the edge of some of their criteria. But when Precourt said this was the time to do it, then they radioed up to the shuttle to, uh, to fire those engines into the deorbit burn. And that's done now, so, uh, so we'll have a landing here at four minutes afternoon Eastern time. Saw that? Bob, we spoke to Janice Voss, an astronaut, who said that there'll be four opportunities for the shuttle to touch down. If there's some kind of a problem or the weather changes or something, they only have those four chances to land successfully, or what happens? No more chances. This is it. You, you got one try at it once you do that deorbit burn, which they've done now, uh, because you can't get back up into orbit to continue on. Uh, so, so there's no more four chances. They got to bring it into uh, to Canaveral now. Uh, but the weather here, I mean, just visually, you can see it's it's a beautiful blue sky. They had some clouds off the coast before, but they've gone away. Winds are a little bit of a crosswind, but not enough to bother them. So they're committed at this point. All right, NBC's Bob Hager, thanks a lot for joining us. You, you can stay tuned for live coverage of the shuttle landing beginning at 11:30 a.m. Eastern Time, 8:30 a.m. Pacific, right here on MSNBC. In other news, Republicans still recovering from space shuttle discovery and John Glenn's return to Earth. Uh, let's check in with Trace Gallagher, who's standing by at the Johnson Space Center in Houston for that much-anticipated landing. Trace? Hi, John. Yeah, it's bad news for John Glenn. Of course, it's great news for NASA. Everything on this trip has gone according to Hoyle, including the landing. They said they were going to land at 12.04 Eastern Time, and sure enough, they are landing at Kennedy Space Center at 12.04 Eastern Time, and not only John Glenn kicking and screaming coming back into orbit because he wants to stay up there, but... As uh, your, your crew was saying there, he doesn't have much of a view coming down, sitting in the mid-deck between Pedro Duque and Chiaki Mukai, just like on ascent. John Glenn will feel some of the effects, but he's not going to have much of a view unless he kind of cranes his neck. Again, the uh, re-entry takes about an hour and 15 minutes, about 35 minutes before they actually get grabbed by gravity, and then another 40 minutes before they actually glide into landing. Everyone's wondering, once John Glenn gets off, what will happen? Well, he'll spend about four hours being examined by doctors. That's the longest examination of any of the crew members. The other crew members should take about an hour, hour and a half, two hours. John Glenn spent four hours in the doctor's office because obviously they want to find out how the 77-year-old fared. We're also kind of wondering what John Glenn is going to say 
and I'm wondering what he hasn't said already. He's already spoken with Vice President Al Gore. He's spoken with the Prime Minister of Japan, the Education Minister of Spain, the media four times, uh, school children on three different occasions, and of course he even had time to chime in with Jay Leno on The Tonight Show. So John Glenn has been uh, very well heard from during this entire mission. John? Uh, Trace, we should not be surprised if John Glenn comes off the shuttle in a wheelchair, I'm told. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you bet, and I'm sure uh, Jim Lovell can talk about that as well. You're talking about coming down, you haven't used your calf muscles in 10 days, and when you finally come down into gravity, you have to use those muscles all over again. Your body weight feels about twice what it normally feels because you've been, obviously, in floating around for 10 days, so John Glenn will be a little weak in the knees, and he may very well come off in a wheelchair. Yeah, and the doctors want him to do that, as we understand. I'm sure the old fighter pilot in him doesn't want to, but that may be what we see. Let's